Hi, I'm Dr. Henry T. Nicholas III, and you're watching Facets Television. Hi, I'm Sandra Hutchins. I'm the Sheriff Coroner of Orange County, and you're watching Facets Television. Hello, my name is Judge Jim Gray. I'm retired from the Orange County Superior Court, and you are watching Facets Television. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and you are back here with me in the judges' chambers. I'm a retired Superior Court judge from Orange County, California. Prior to that, I was in private practice. Before that, I was a federal prosecutor, and prior to that, I actually was in the, in the Navy as a military JAG. So I've had a lot of experience in our criminal justice system. And one thing that I have seen brought home to me in my own chambers, as well as just open your eyes, is the over-incarceration by the United States of America. You're probably aware, maybe not, that the United States has about 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners. Now look, we all know that we need prisons. We need jails without any question. But there was someone that made the comment that I fully agree with. We should reserve our prison space for people that we're afraid of not people we're mad at, because we now have overreacted so much where we have mandatory minimum prisons, we have three strikes and you're out, we have all of these required sentences that sometimes judges who are real conservative dudes are in tears because the law requires them to sentence people to abnormally long prison sentences. Let's change the way from that. No one in advance can decide what a reasonable sentence is without knowing who the perpetrator is, what the circumstances, the background how badly the victims were, were injured, if at all. So we can't do that. Give judges some discretion. We have, in California alone, in my opinion, maybe 10,000 people that shouldn't be in prison that actually are right this minute. Let's look at their sentences and see whether, in fact, it was sentenced too much. Talk to wardens and see how they have done, whether they've been model prisoners or not, and release them sometimes outright, or if they have drug problems, help them with drug rehabilitation issues, things like that. We also have people in geriatrics that they, they couldn't hurt you, they couldn't throw their walker at you if they wanted to. So let's address all of these things. It's inordinately expensive for the taxpayers, inordinately expensive for the families as well as the individuals. Let's reduce incarceration in the United States of America. It will reduce our taxes and not make us less safe. At least that's what I think from my observations, and I think that you would agree. I actually went not too long ago to New Orleans where they had a seminar a conference about that very subject sponsored by the Koch brothers, for heaven's sake. If we have the Koch brothers understanding this issue, I think that it will sweep the country as well it should. Let's think about it. It's the human thing to do. It's the responsible thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. Reserve prison space for people that we're upset with, that we're afraid of, not that we're mad at. That's what I think from the judges' chambers. I hope you agree. Talk to you again next time. Hi, I'm Bob White. Ninth Degree Black Belt, and you are watching Facets Television. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and who are you? You're right here with me in the judges' chambers. I'm a retired Superior Court judge from Orange County, California. Let's talk about political renewal. It's important to have renewal in your lives, changes healthy in our normal personal lives, corporate lives, and certainly government as well. Let's talk about renewal. Let's talk on occasion to step back and see where we are, where we've been, and where we want to go kind of an, an audit of, of, in effect, what our life is. You go back to Thomas Jefferson, truly one of my heroes, and he said that in our country we should have a bloody revolution every generation. Well, how long has it been since we've had a revolution politically of any kind in our country? Maybe 1860s when Lincoln was elected and the Republicans took over from the Whigs, maybe in the early 1900s. But fortunately, I dropped the bloody from Thomas Jefferson's statement because the Founding Fathers gave us the tools to be able to change. Amending the Constitution, a legislature and Congress that will have checks and balances and the rest of this. But it really is essential for us to sit back, have 
have that audit and see where we are, where we've been, and where we want to go. There are all kinds of reasons for it, very few reasons against it. Let's put our heads together, talk with each other, and come up with the idea of, hey, isn't it refreshing to have some political renewal in the United States of America, as well as each state and city, and in our individual lives as well. I've seen that from the bench. It works. I hope you agree, and maybe we'll discuss it further, more intimately, next time in the Judges' Chambers. My name is George Cesaros, Chief of Huntington Park Police Department, and you're watching Facets Television. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and welcome back to being with me in the judges' chambers. I'm a retired judge from the Orange County Superior Court in California. I'd like to talk to you about anger. You know, we have anger in our society in many ways, and of course has to, can be constructive sometimes, but you have to keep it under control. And in my view, there's so much anger today about people in Washington, and it's taking over the presidential debates. I am happy to tell you unabashedly that I support Governor Gary Johnson as a libertarian candidate for President of the United States of America, and I'm also happy to tell you that he is now polling in double digits. That means that if he could poll even under the Commission of Presidential Debates, supposed policy, which is completely controlled by Republicans and Democrats, if he could poll at 15 percent, he would be a part of the presidential debates in October and the finals prior to that election in, Jan in November. Really important stuff, just to get a third party view out there. Thomas Jefferson, the ideal libertarian, who by the way said, look, I don't care if you worship one god or twenty gods or no god it doesn't pick my pocket and it doesn't break my leg a real libertarian position but he said we need to have he said a bloody revolution every generation i dropped the word bloody because it's not necessary but how long has it been since we've had a revolution in our country to get rid of the deadwood the vested interest and everything else it's been at least since eighteen sixty when the republicans took over from the whig party now is the time to bring in a third voice to bring in responsibility responsibility to bring in financial responsibility and social acceptance. We are classic liberals, we are classic conservatives, our voice must be heard and you will be the beneficiary of that. So please talk to your friends, talk to your members of Congress, talk to the Commission on Presidential Debates and have them include any political party that's on enough ballots technically to win the presidency. We're on, we'll be on all 50 ballots this year. The Green Party is on the ballots in 40 states last election they should have their voices heard as well. So that's what I think, Judge Jim Gray and the judges' chambers. It's the American way. I hope you agree. Stay tuned. It's going to happen. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and where are you? You're right here with me in the judges' chambers. I'm a retired Superior Court judge from Orange County, California. Let's talk about political renewal. It's important to have renewal in your lives, changes healthy in our normal personal lives, corporate lives, and certainly government as well. Let's talk about renewal. Let's talk on occasion to step back and see where we are, where we've been, and where we want to go kind of an, an audit of, of, in effect, what our life is. You go back to Thomas Jefferson, truly one of my heroes, and he said that in our country we should have a bloody revolution every generation. Well, how long has it been since we've had a revolution politically of any kind in our country? Maybe 1860s when Lincoln was elected and the Republicans took over from the Whigs, maybe in the early 1900s. But fortunately, I dropped the bloody from Thomas Jefferson's statement because the Founding Fathers gave us the tools to be able to change. Amending the Constitution, a legislature and Congress that will have checks and balances and the rest of this. But it really is essential for us to sit back, have that audit, and see where we are, where we've been, and where we want to go. There are all kinds of reasons for it, very few reasons against it. Let's put our heads together, talk with each other, and come up with the idea of, hey, isn't it refreshing to have some political renewal in the United States of America, as well as each state and city, and in our individual lives as well. I've seen that from the bench. It works. I hope you agree, and maybe we'll discuss it further, more intimately, next time in the judges' chambers.
Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and welcome back to another session of us in the Judges' Chambers. I want to talk to you about something that is fundamental in our democracy, which, by the way, seems to be slipping through our fingers, and that is contributions to these political candidates. I've been a candidate. I'm here to tell you, which you already know, money is much too important in our political lives and in our elections. What can we do about it? Honestly, I believe that money is a matter of speech. And if I were Bill Gates, for example, I'd be able to spend my millions, tens of millions of dollars on my own campaign. I think that's appropriate. I think Bill Gates should be able to spend his tens of millions of dollars on someone else's campaign as well. So if I were King, and King James has kind of a ring to it, but it hasn't caught on yet, probably no danger there. But I believe that anyone, any human individual should be able to donate as much money as he or she feels that they want to to whichever candidate, but disclose it immediately. And then if you think, if I'm a candidate and I'm receiving money from Bill Gates and I'm in his pocket, vote for my opponent. But the whole Citizens United case is an atrocity, is simply the wrong thing. Do not allow any non-human being to donate any money at all to any election. So that means corporations, it means unions, it means anyone. If their individual voters want to do it, if their individual constituents or whatever want to do it, bless them, let them, but do it in their own name. That accomplishes what we need to accomplish. Because you know something? The big guys are always able to get their way. They're always able to funnel their money through, through PACs, through one way or the other to the candidates. Just open it up, disclose it completely, and get on with it. That's what I think. Let's do one more thing as well. The Orange County Register recently had an editorial saying, we'll always have money affecting government, always affecting politics, but we need to take money out of government more. If you had the government not as involved in dealing with all of these money issues in the private sector or anywhere else and shrink that government, then there'll be less reason for money to come into politics because the money won't be there. Shrink government size, shrink government involvement and power, and that will bring a lot more democracy back to our whole system. That's what I think as Judge Jim Gray in the Judges Chambers. What do you think? Let's talk about it some more on a new edition here at Time Warner on the Judges Chambers. See you then. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and welcome back with me here in the Judges' Chambers. As you may know, I was the Libertarian candidate for Vice President of the United States, along with Governor Gary Johnson, for President in the year 2012. So I am a Libertarian. Not dogmatically about it, but you know, we have a problem going on that really is exemplary as to what our problems are between government and the private sector right now, and that's this deal between Apple and their, their cell phones as to, and the government demanding that they provide a code to break into the, the cell phone information. I side with Apple. I feel that, that the private sector should be able to keep these things confidential. However, I would have one disagreement, and that is require Apple or similar companies to maintain that information. Then if you get a warrant, if you have a specific circumstance where you can go to a judge with probable cause, then you can get a warrant and require Apple to provide that individual information to you. I think that works, but giving all this information to the government is perilous course to take. We don't want to do that. Forcing Apple to do something is a problem, I agree, but it's a lot better than the government hacking into it, which they could probably eventually do. So that's where I come down on this. Difficult decision. Hey, life is sometimes complicated. We know that as libertarians. You know that as citizens as well. But that's what Judge Jim Gray thinks about that Apple and government situation. Think about it. I think you'll find that it makes sense. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray once again with you in the Judges' Chambers. There are lots of things to talk about, but let's talk about the political system. Let's go to a th at least three-party system. What would happen if that were to occur? Well, actually, Governor Gary Johnson and I have a lawsuit that is pending right now suing the Presidential Debates Commission as well as the Republican National Committee and Democratic National Committee to be a part of the debates. They don't want us to be there. They control, that is, the Republicans and Democrats, control 
control the Presidential Debates Commission, and then, coincidentally, when it comes time to issue invitations, they only invite the Republicans and Democratic candidates. What if, in fact, we instead had the criterion the way it used to be, which would require any political party that's on enough ballots, technically in enough states to win the presidency, should have a seat at the table of the debates. That's the way it was when the League of Women Voters was running the presidential debates, but they got frozen out to the degree that when they finally left because they were no longer going to be a part of this, they issued a public statement that you should be aware of. We are not going to be a part of the hoodwinking of America. That was their terms, not ours. Let's bring that back, and then we will discuss various issues that now the main candidates do not want to discuss. Example, Mr. Obama, Mr. Romney in 2012 did not want to talk about Obamacare, so they didn't. Or drug policy, they didn't. Immigration, they didn't. All of our active military around, uh, around the world with various military ventures, they did not discuss. We would have done that. An additional thing really important for us is to take charge of the gerrymandering that goes on in coming up with various congressional districts all around the country. The Republicans and Democrats control that and so, okay, they'll give me a safe district as long as, of course, you get a safe district as well. You may not be aware of this, but in the last year of the Politburo, before the fall of the Soviet Union, they had more turnover than we did in the United States Congress for exactly that reason. Put a group of retired judges to make those decisions as to where those districts should be, and we'll get away from that. Final thought, term limits. You know, term limits are not working for us. Instead, have term limits of, say, two terms for a United States senator, then make the senator sit out for a term. Allow them to run again six years later for, for the same seat if they want to. Have that break, but we're losing an awful lot of seniority and an awful lot of knowledge. So term limits have led us astray. We need to change that one. We need to bring democracy back. We are losing it. It's slipping through our fingers. Our votes don't count down nearly as much as they should. And by the way, it's our government. If it's not working, it's our responsibility to change it. That's what I think as Judge Jim Gray in the judges' chambers. Come back and we'll talk again pretty soon. Come back and be with us. We'll see you then. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and welcome back to In the Judges' Chambers. There are lots of things to talk about, and we have various segments, but today I'd like to talk to you about health care. You know something? I saw a sign here in Orange County last week while driving in my car. It's about four feet by three feet, and it expressed where our country is going in this way and so many others in four words. And it said, claim your subsidy, Obamacare. Claim your subsidy, Obamacare. Just think with me for a minute as to where we're going. You are entitled. You don't have to do anything. We owe it to you, etc. And you are going to receive free stuff. Now look, I was in the Peace Corps. I care about people and I want to make sure that people in our country certainly have access to good quality health care. But this is not the way to go. For example, you ask people, do you want the Department of Motor Vehicles to run your medical care? Well, I think I know the answer to that question, and probably so do you, but that's where we're going. The alternative is, look, yes, there are some people that cannot take care of themselves, segregate them out, but otherwise, get the government out of health care completely. I was raised in the 50s up to middle 60s. It was not even a topic of conversation that we cannot find reasonable health care for reasonable prices, just not even discussed. Then the government starts getting more and more involved. So once again, get the government out of the health care for us that we can take care of ourselves and let the government simply get away from it. Then for those people that cannot, give them out vouchers, for example, pieces of paper that they can use on the free market to buy their own health care. There will be a market for it, the prices will come down, competition again will come in, and we will reclaim that excellence in health care that once we had before the government kept getting involved. So, do you want the government to run your health care? How about the Department of Motor Vehicles running your health care? The answer is no. Final thought. Today, even now, there are two areas of health care where you and I can get reasonable, competitive, quality health care for reasonable prices. What is that? Think about it. LASIK eye surgery and cosmetic surgery. Why? Because the government is not involved. If you go to a medical doctor today and say, well, I've got a knee problem, doc, and the doctor says, well, Jim, do you want an MRI? Well, why not? You know, I have the 
probably a low copay through all my insurance and Medicare cost me twenty to thirty dollars I might as well get the quality all the time but if I was paying my own money I would say well I don't know doc how much is it going to cost and what's it going to show me that brings competition back quality comes back we get the health care that we once had we led the world for a while we certainly do not now we spend too much money the government is too bureaucratic too much waste too much fraud get the government out of it use vouchers for those that cannot afford it and bring that quality back that's what I think judge Jim Gray has spoken give, give it some thought and welcome back again soon to the judges chambers Hello, welcome back with me here in the judges chambers. My name is Judge Jim Gray. I'm a retired Superior Court judge from Orange County, California. You know, I have two thoughts with regard to our process of making or retaining laws. One of them would be sunset provisions for all laws. I don't know how long we can put our heads together and figure it out. Maybe every 12, 15 years, maybe even longer, each law would in effect disappear. Sunset provisions unless it was reaffirmed as an active act by Congress and signed again by the President or by the Governor. So that way we could look at what we have on the books because I can tell you from 25 years on the bench, we have many too many laws. They conflict, they have problems. Of course, it's brought to judges to decide, well, which law should supersede the other if they're ambiguous or they go against each other. So in effect, it would be a renewal of those laws. The second thought I have, boy, try to get this one through Congress, but in British Columbia, their, their Congress, uh, their parliament, has a rule that there's any before any bill can become law, it has to be read verbatim, each word, three times on the floor of Parliament. The first time is kind of pro forma, but the second time, listen to this, they actually are required to read each, each paragraph, stop, debate it, vote on it, then go to the next paragraph. That way, not only do people understand what's in it, what an amazing idea, but they actually discuss it, compromise, and work things out. That reduces, of course, the number of laws that can go through Parliament. What a good idea that would be. And also, actually, people understand what they are. So things like the tax codes and, and the spending bills and stuff would never see the light of day because you couldn't possibly read those in a week on the floor of Congress. So those are two thoughts that I have. I think they would be beneficial. We need those changes in our government. We need to be refreshed. We need to audit. We need to know what in heaven's name is going on with our laws. These are two ways that we will. Those are my thoughts from the judges' chambers. Think about them. I think you might find them attractive as well. We'll see. I'm Mark Babbitt, CEO and founder of U-Turn, and you're watching Facets Television. Hello. Hello, my name is Jim Gray. I'm a retired judge from the Orange County Superior Court, and I was asked the question, what do I think about civil asset forfeiture, mostly with regard to our drug prohibition policies? And the answer is, it's an institutional corruption. It simply is wrongly wrongly set up. Why? Because our various law enforcement officers have an have a vested interest in seizing property so they can use it to buy various items. As far as forfeiting property, money, whatever, gain from the sale of illegal drugs, I have no problem with that. However, two major changes should occur. The first is no forfeitures until after the person is convicted of a crime, and then you submit that information and evidence to the same jury to see if, it sh if the property should be forfeited. And number two, none of that money should go to any individual agencies. It should all go to the general fund. That way the incentives stay where they are, namely do the right thing for the right reason and don't share a part of the booty or the plunder. That's what I think from my judges' chambers. I hope you agree with me. We'll talk about these issues and more next time on the judges' chambers. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray. Welcome back to being with me in the judges' chambers. I'm a retired Superior Court judge from Orange County, California. You know something? I think that we as a nation must make a decision. What is the purpose of our school system? And it's either to educate our children or to protect below average children. And guess what we're doing today? You know, we have so many teachers that simply have become lazy because they have tenure and no fear of being fired, or they're just not competent enough to get the job done. So where do they end up going? 
Unfortunately, and you can see this like anyone else, they usually go to the lower, they're sent to the schools in the lower economic areas. Unfortunately, mostly made up of people of color. So they have schools that are failing our children. And it's simply an outrage. It is something that we, equality should, should demand better. We can, however, provide excellence in our schools. Why? Think of it this way. We do not have the government overseeing and, and involving themselves in the pricing of computers or cell phones or the rest. It's done by the free market competition. And what do we have? Great quality products for pretty reasonable prices. Why don't we have the same process with regard to our education? Allow the parents, empower the parents to choose where their government money is going to be spent for the education of their children and they will demand excellence. And you know what? They will receive it. Ask people that live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where they have had school choice now for upwards of eight, nine years. They'll tell you, we don't have any bad schools anymore. They've either gotten better or they've gone out of business, to which I said, and you should join me in saying, good, it can be done. It's starting to happen in Indiana, in Florida, in New Orleans. Let's bring it around the country. We guarantee excellence in school education if you empower the parents to choose. You can call it a voucher, a coupon, a scholarship. It doesn't matter what you call it. Empower the parents to choose because they know better how their children should be educated. They can go to military schools, public schools, private schools, religious schools. Even they can go to, to schools just to get a vocation. Teach them a skill if that's what should happen. School choice works. Demand it. That's what I think from the judges' chambers, and I hope you do as well. Today in the segment, I'd like to, like to talk to you about just the philosophy of government, probably the most basic philosophical governmental question, you could, political question you could ask yourself, and that is, how much government do you want? Now we all know, even as libertarians, that we need some government without question. We need to have a military, a police force to protect ourselves from other countries and from each other. Uh, we need to have a court system so that we can enforce our contracts, enforce our warranties, etc. But ask yourself right now, how much government do you want? Because government is an entity also. Government is really good at one thing, and that is increasing the size, the cost, the power of government. So government is also money. Let's face it, I've been in the government system for a long time. Government is money. It's who you take it from and who you give it to. And if you're liberal, so-called, you know, you'll give it to this cause or that cause. If you're conservative, so-called, that doesn't mean you want smaller government. It just means that you want to give government to your t side of the table. So that's the question that we need to ask. In the private sector, we do things so much better. And in that regard, think mosquito nets. What is this guy talking about? Well, we all know that in a number of African countries, they have malaria problems still. And it's shown by statistics, for every 10 mosquito nets that are put into someone's house, you're going to save the life of at least one person. And it costs public foundations, private enterprise, something in the order of $3.12 per mosquito net on the ground. It costs the government about three times that, almost $10 per mosquito net. So we can get it done. As a functional libertarian, I believe, of course, we need to have government, but government is the last resort instead of the first resort. That's where I come down. Ask yourself, how much government do you want? Who's in a better position to decide how your money should be spent, you or the government? Hmm, what a question. We'll talk about other things like this next time in the Judges' Chambers. Hello again, this is Judge Jim Gray, and welcome again back to In the Judges' Chambers. You know, I've written a book on various issues called A Voter's Handbook, Effective Solutions to America's Problems. And at the, in the introduction, I say the last chapter will be the shortest and the easiest because it will talk about immigration. That's really the easiest issue to fix. What should we do? You know, it's not very tough. You give out 
work visas pretty liberally to people in other countries that can show that they can come in here, support themselves, have a background check with regard to mental issues maybe and criminal justice issues and otherwise give these out pretty liberally. If they can support themselves, they can come in. If they can support their families, they can come in as well. No welfare, pay their taxes, be regulated, be controlled, and I don't care, call it an orange card, whatever it is, they can show that at the border, they can come into the country, they can work, pay their taxes, and then, of course, since they're here legally, they'll have driver's licenses, they'll get insurance, the problems will really start disappearing. This is not an access to citizenship, that's a different issue, but it will regulate and control these things. Millions, in the meantime, millions of people are being punished. Why don't we do this? The answer is fairly straightforward, and I'm sorry to have to reveal it to you. There are numbers of very high-placed Republicans that give lip service to changing the message, but they don't want to because they're enamored with the cheap labor. And there are a very lot of powerful Democrats that love the idea of lots of people coming into the country, eventually voting for Democrats, so they give lip service to this change. They don't want to change it either. Obviously, because if they wanted to change it, they would have decades ago. They could change it right away. They don't want to. Governor Gary Johnson from New Mexico was campaigning on this issue. I was running with him as a libertarian for vice president. We, put these, we would put these things in right away. Not tough. In the meantime, millions of people are suffering. Immigration, that is an issue that we can and must change. Talk to us again in the judges' chambers. We'll discuss more issues because there's no lack of those. See us again soon. Talk to you then. Hello, my name is Judge Jim Gray. I'm a retired Superior Court judge in Orange County, California, and you are here with me in the judges' chambers. I'm going to tell you an experience that you unfortunately probably don't know too much about, that in the year 2012, I was the libertarian candidate for vice president of the United States of America. I was working with our presidential candidate, Governor Gary Johnson, who probably you don't know who he is either, and that is a shame. So let me just tell you a little bit about Governor Gary Johnson, who I am devoted to for good reasons. Number one, when he was in college, he started his own handyman company, turned that eventually into one of the largest construction companies in New Mexico, had a thousand employees, made payroll, people were happy, and then out of the box, he ran for governor of the state of New Mexico. He was a Republican at the time, had no prior political experience. People kind of patted him on the head and say, well, it's a wonderful idea, but it'll never work. But it did. And then he governed New Mexico as a Republican, that is a Democratic state, and was reelected for governor by a larger majority. By the way, People really responded to him. He left the state with a billion dollar surplus. He said, oh, people, you know, because he repealed more laws than, than or successed his spending measures pretty much than all other 49 governors combined. And he says with a chuckle that, well, you know, people were estimating that folks were going to be rioting in the streets and children were going to be starving, none of which happened. It was just excessive crony capitalism spending. And he also, by the way, ended up standing up tall and saying he's conducted his audit of our nation's drug policy, it's not working, and made suggestions that we change it. Had no political constituency to do that. Now, you may agree with him or disagree, but wouldn't you want someone as president that would have the fortitude to stand up, take some heat, and say, this is what I believe, this is where we should go. So I was his vice presidential candidate running in 2012. He is running for president in 2016. Look into Governor Gary Johnson. As a side, I would suggest to you, go to the website isidewith.com, the letter I, isidewith.com, take the 25 or so questions that they ask you, rate them in priority as far as how strongly or, or not strongly you, you uh, believe in them, and then push the submit button, and you will see the results where your political ideas are closest to whichever political presidential candidate is running right now. You'll find it to be interesting. I took it. I came out 97% with Governor Gary Johnson, and after you took away the libertarians, I came out very close, actually, to Bernie Sanders, 69%. You take away the, the financial things, and you find socially that he and we are very, very close together. Try it. It's interesting. Isidewith.com. Help is on the way. That's what I think from the judges' chambers. Look in. Hello, my name is Jim Gray. I'm a retired judge from the Orange County Superior Court here in California. 
proud to be such, actually, and you are with me in the judges' chambers. You know something? We have a supreme law of the land. It's called the Constitution of the United States of America, and it's there for a reason. We do not have a democracy in our country, thankfully. We have a republic. What's the difference? Well, we use the democracy, but we also have that supreme law of the land as the Constitution to stand up for and protect minority values. A democracy, basically, if you think about it, is two foxes and one chicken voting as to what to have for dinner. Uh, the chicken doesn't do very well. But with the republic and the constitution, we actually take care of and protect minority rights. We have a program in, in Orange County, California, as well as numbers of other counties. Ours is run by the Constitutional Rights Foundation, and it's going on about a mock trial in which we have various high schools around the state competing in mock trials about constitutional issues and then putting on a trial. They stand up for and understand then the importance of the Fourth Amendment with regard to search and seizure or the First Amendment about our freedom of speech, etc. This makes our young people better citizens, more aware, they'll be better voters, and they'll come up with thoughts like, wait a minute, that's not a technicality, that's our Constitution. Those are our civil liberties. Uh, I'm a libertarian, I am a flaming liberal when it comes to our civil liberties and our civil protections, governed by the Constitution of the United States of America. Those founding fathers were brilliant, and what they have done is a gift to the rest of us. However, like Ronald Reagan says, freedom is not free. We've got to be eternally vigilant. That's what I tried to do as a judge. I will still try. All of us as citizens can do the same thing. Remember, it's the Constitution that protects us from each other and from the government. Worth protecting. That's what I think in my judges' chambers. What do you think? We'll talk about these issues and more in the next time on the judges' chambers. See you then. Hello, my name is Jim Gray. I'm a retired judge from the Orange County Superior Court in California, and you are with me in a judge's chambers. Let's talk about the political reality for the criminal justice system, because the voters and members of the legislature have been really getting tough on crime, supposedly, for the last 10, 20, even 30 years. And what's happened? It really has not worked. What we have really done is clogged the courts, the jails, and the prisons with low-level offenders, and we are simply not realizing the fact that the tougher you get with regard to nonviolent crime, the softer you get with regard to the prosecutions of robbery, rape, and murder. And so as a result, we are simply sinking in the court system as a result of all of this. Fortunately, the voters around the country are getting smarter. Here in California, you're probably aware that we passed Proposition 47 to delete mostly a possession of narcotics, for example, from a felony to a misdemeanor, not involving now going to state prison, but instead staying in your local jails. That's a really good idea. We're saving millions, tens of millions of dollars in doing this, and the voters had the foresight to say, okay, let's spend some of this money on areas in which we can help ourselves. That is, with mental health in the prisons, mental health out of the prisons, or with education and things like that. You're probably not aware of this, but you should be. Pretty much every county in our country has its largest mental health facility, namely as the local county jail, doing untold damage to these mentally fragile people. Let's stop that and put the money into resources that will actually assist them in living better, more productive lives. We can do this. We are doing it here in Orange County. I recommend it to you as well. If you're interested in your county, contact me, Judge Jim Gray. Com. I will respond to you by email and give you the information that you need. These are programs that work. They're not only more compassionate, they're better for the taxpayer, they're better for everybody except, honestly, the prison guards union. I think we can all not shed a tear for that one. So that's what I think from my judges' chambers. Give it some thought. We'll talk about this idea and more next time. Stay tuned.
Hello, this is Jim Gray. I am a retired judge of the Orange County Superior Court, and you are with me in a judge's chambers. Today I would like to talk to you about a program that regardless of what your political philosophy is, it's not working. And that is, from my own observations and involvement, the death penalty. You know something? Again, whether you are conservative and you want to have people executed for sometimes very heinous offenses, or you feel that that's just not appropriate for the state to execute or kill people, it isn't working. What is happening is that we have hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people around the country that have been on death row for 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years, and it simply is not having anything occur. So why? Well, honestly, from the court system, we're too compassionate a people, and I think that's a good thing. We want to make sure that all of these defendants have all of the protections that the Constitution can give them, and here in California, that means it takes at least 10 to 15 years to go through the trial itself, if they're convicted, then go through the appellate process in the state, and then after that, it starts all over again with the federal government. Do I think that's appropriate? Yes, I do. However, what is really happening here is the victims, the ones who are supposedly foremost in our mind, the people that are left behind, the family members, the grieving folks, are actually penalized. They're taken advantage of politically and they have to go through this waiting period for decades. I myself was involved in one preliminary hearing for a really bad guy who was eventually killed, excuse me, he was uh, convicted of three murders. That was in 1987. He was convicted in 1988, and he's still on death row, not even close to having this appellate process finished. And that isn't even talking about what the state's going to do as far as the various cocktails, etc., to have this occur. In the meantime, you're not aware of this, but conservatively speaking, it costs us as taxpayers sometimes about seven to eight times the amount of money to keep a person in this process than it would to convict this person of an LWOP, that is a life without possibility of parole, and the appellate process, and keep that person in prison for the rest of his or her life, seven to eight times more. So once again, this just isn't working. To finish the comment, in Orange County and, Cal and in Los Angeles County, within a month of each other, there was the legitimate outrageous situation in which the defendants were convicted of the underlying charges and then requested the death penalty, which the jury gave to them. Why? Well, it's a better life. You know, if you're on death row, you have half again as large a cell. You don't have a roommate, so you have a bigger place for yourself. You get more television rights, more library rights, more visitation rights. It's a better life, and they're not executed anyway. So regardless of your of views, Let's abolish the death penalty. Just abolish it. Our country couldn't even join the European Union if we had death penalty in, in the United States of America. So let's abolish it and do something a lot smarter, which is life without possibility of parole. That's what I think for my judges' chambers. Give it some thought. This is Jim Gray. I'll see you again soon. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and welcome back to join me in the judges' chambers. I'd like to talk to you about prisons. You know, we have in California alone, by the year 1980, we had 13 state prisons. Now we have 33, all of them seriously overcrowded. So we obviously have too many prisons and too many people there. But what about private prisons? You know, why not go into private prisons instead? And the answer is, as a libertarian, I'm here to say I believe in private prisons. They work far better. They, are, they accomplish more things more safely. They get involved in more, uh, reci less recidivism and more education along the way. However, really fundamentally importantly, we cannot have anyone in the private sector deciding who comes to the private prison, how many people come to the private prison, or how long they stay. Those are issues that must be done publicly. But otherwise, private prisons are okay. Otherwise, too, we should cl start closing some of our state prisons. Uh, for example, you know, really, you get into some of these older prisons, it costs so much money to keep them going. Private prisons have something on the order of 12 inmates for every uh, custodial officer. In the state prison system, in the public system, it's about two inmates per custodial officer. So we get involved in things that really should not be there. 
Private sector works pretty well as long as we keep public control. Just a thought that you might want to consider next time you're thinking about this issue. Private sector really works pretty well. Government is really good at one thing, though, and that is increasing the size, the cost, and the, the power of, of government. That's happened in the prison system. That's happening elsewhere as well. That's what I, as a libertarian judge, feel. What do you think? We'll talk about these and other issues on the next segment of In the Judges' Chambers. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and welcome back to another edition of The Judges' Chambers. You're with me. Let's share some thoughts. One of them is, maybe some of you know, I've been actively speaking against our nation's drug policy since 1992. And now I say that it is the biggest failed policy in the history of our country, second only to slavery. In fact, I'll go beyond that, which is a pretty strong statement, and say any interest of yours that's close to your heart. I will show you to your satisfaction how it is made worse because of this program of drug prohibition. I don't care if it's the environment, health care, education, whatever, whatever, it is made worse because of that. Fortunately, there's help on the horizon. We've all seen what's happened in the state of Washington, the state of Colorado, in their elections in 2012, passing initiatives to treat marijuana in effect like wine good idea. We in California are going to have the same type of initiative on the ballot in 2016, I'm here to tell you. And in fact, we actually had one that we wanted to have on the ballot in 2012, but I regret to say we couldn't get our act together and we didn't get it done. But we did send it through the Attorney General's office and got back the information, the ex explanation about it that would have been on the ballot had we gotten the initiative there. And it said, we will, as Californians, save tens of millions of dollars every year in enforcement costs and generate hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. That ensured its passage. It will pass in 2016. And thereafter, all of us will look back at marijuana prohibition and think, why did we perpetuate such a failed system for so long? So stick with us. It will be on the ballot. We hope to have your success. We hope to have your support in 2016. Let's do this thing right, just like is going on in other states right now. So that's what I think from the judges' chambers. What do you think? I don't know. Let's find out. We'll meet again soon in another judges' chambers. See you then. Chambers. You know, I see with concern that there is a lot of militarization of our police departments in all, in pretty much all around our country. And this concerns me deeply. A lot of it is constituted by the federal government. They bribe, that's the word I mean to use, they bribe lots of cities to continue to be involved in the drug war. Why? Because they give them grants, namely bribes, and they give them large amounts of money, but they have to use it to fight the war on drugs. What do they do with a lot of that money? They buy a lot of equipment. You know, they start dressing themselves as ninja warriors, and they'll get battering rams, and the rest of that, uh, you get into SWAT teams, you get into very military-type operations, and I tell you, as we understand, if you have the stuff, you can only train so much, you eventually have to use it, and so they do. Oh, they'll use SWAT teams, for example, to raid medical marijuana dispensaries. They will use SWAT teams or militarization when they have protests. You know, they'll have people on horseback and they'll have all of the, the military outfits. The answer is no. The answer is we are responsible for our police, we are responsible for our government, and if they're not doing what they should be, it's our responsibility to hold them in check. And we've got to get away from this militarization. When I was raised, maybe like you, depending on your age, I was told it was drummed into me by my parents. Jimmy, if you get lost, what are you going to do? And the answer is, I'm going to find a policeman. The policeman is my friend. How many parents say that to their children now? I don't think it happens nearly enough. We need to get back to what works. Community policing, responsibility at all levels, restorative justice, and a lot less of this incarceration, arresting, and militarization. That's what I think from my vantage point as a former criminal defense attorney in the Navy, a former federal prosecutor, and a 25-year veteran on the trial court bench. What do you think? Responsibility is key, and if it ain't working, it's our fault. Let's join together and do something about it and demand responsibility at all levels of society. That's what I think. We'll talk some more in next time in the Judges' Chambers. Hello, this is Judge Jim Gray, and you are with me in the Judges' Chambers. Today in the segment, I'd like to, like to talk to you about just 
the philosophy of government, probably the most basic philosophical governmental question, you could, political question you could ask yourself, and that is, how much government do you want? Now, we all know, even as libertarians, that we need some government without question. We need to have a military, a police force to protect ourselves from other countries and from each other. Uh, we need to have a court system so that we can enforce our contracts, enforce our warranties, etc. But ask yourself right now, how much government do you want? Because government is an entity also. Government is really good at one thing, and that is increasing the size, the cost, the power of government. So government is also money. Let's face it, I've been in the government system for a long time. Government is money. It's who you take it from and who you give it to. And if you're liberal, so-called, you know, you'll give it to this cause or that cause. If you're conservative, so-called, that doesn't mean you want smaller government. It just means that you want to give government to your t side of the table. So that's the question that we need to ask. In the private sector, we do things so much better. And in that regard, think mosquito nets. What is this guy talking about? Well, we all know that in a number of African countries, they have malaria problems still. And it's shown by statistics, for every 10 mosquito nets that are put into someone's house, you're going to save the life of at least one person. And it costs public foundations, private enterprise, something in the order of $3.12 per mosquito net on the ground. It costs the government about three times that, almost $10 per mosquito net. So we can get it done. As a functional libertarian, I believe, of course, we need to have government, but government is the last resort instead of the first resort. That's where I come down. Ask yourself, how much government do you want? Who's in better position to decide how your money should be spent, you or the government? Hmm, what a question. We'll talk about other things like this next time in the Judges' Chambers. Hello, once again, this is Judge Jim Gray talking with you from the Judges' Chambers. You know, the issue that crosses all political boundaries, all racial, economic, whatever boundaries, is the education of our children. We all want our kids to get the best education that they possibly can. And in that regard, we must understand that today, regretfully, numbers and numbers of schools are failing our children. I understand that you agree with that as well. It's simply un you're unable to dispute that fact. So ask yourself a question. Who is in a better position to decide where and how your children should be educated? You as the parents or the government? Okay, I can see there's no hands raised for the government. We all know it's the parents that would do this. If the parents could choose where and how their children would be educated, they would demand excellence. And you know, they would receive it. Now, how can we do that? The answer is to allow the parents to decide where that government money is going to be spent for the education of their, parent, their, of their children. And then if I have a school that's failing, maybe they'll come to me and say, Gray, get it together, or I'm going to take our students over to two miles away or to another neighborhood school, and I'll start losing customers. What happens if I lose customers? I better get better or I'll go out of business, to which I say, good. If I get better, everyone wins. If I go out of business, that's fine. Another entrepreneur will come in, will buy my facility, will have more ingenuity, more creativity, more excellence, and we will get excellence. I was talking recently, actually in the last campaign, in Milwaukee, and I was going through this. Honestly, I forgot where I was because they chimed in immediately. Judge Gray, we don't have any bad schools in Milwaukee anymore. We have that school choice. We have that voucher problem, and the, the bad schools are simply gone, to which, again, I say, terrific. Who's going to win? Our kids. From all economic levels, our kids will get quality education yet again. Who's going to also win? The good teachers. They will be in demand. They'll have fewer restrictions on their teaching. And, by the way, they'll get paid more because if I have a good teacher and I'm not paying him or her well enough, the neighboring teacher school will come in and will take them away, lure them with bigger money. Today, of course, the teachers are not stupid. They know where the money is. It's in administration. So our public schools are top-heavy with administrators. Usually they're the best teachers, leaving the poor paid less important teachers below. The bad teachers will have a problem, to which again I say, good. We can do this all across the land. There's one more issue of equity, and that is, if you see that your schools are failing your children, a lot of people, if they have the wherewithal, will take them out to a private school, which, of course, a lot of people do. 
but it's inequitable because now they're paying for the government schools as well as for the private schools. They're paying twice. Under this new system, they wouldn't be doing that. They can take them to a public school, to a private school, military school, religious school, doesn't matter, technical school. Germany is really good at that and it works well. They can find the school to take care of their children's needs. They will oversee it. It will work. It's working in New Orleans. It's working in Milwaukee. It will work for you. That's what I think with regard to this critically important issue. I hope that you agree. And tune in next time. We'll talk about more issues as well. And in the judges' chambers with Judge Jim Gray. Talk to you then. Hello. This is Judge Jim Gray, and welcome back to the judges' chambers. Today I'd like to ask you a question. What do you think about the idea of having more free-flowing ideas in the presidential debates? For, as you know, Governor Gary Johnson was the presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party in 2012, and I was honored to be the vice presidential candidate. We were not invited by the Presidential Debates Commission to be a part of the debates. Why? Well, they had kind of a moving target as to what the criteria were to be invited, and it was basically if you poll 15% nationwide in three independent surveys, they would invite you. By the way, the Presidential Debates Commission is completely made up of high-ranking Republicans and Democrats. Coincidentally, they only invite Republicans and Democrats to participate. But when the League of Women Voters was running the show, their criterion was that any political party that's on enough ballots in enough states technically to win the presidency should have a seat at the table. We feel that that is appropriate, and in fact, we, you would win as voters to get able to see more political ideas. We were on the ballots in 48 different states in the last election. The Green political party was on the ballots in 40 states. They should have been invited to the debates as well. What would have happened? Well, as you saw in the debates, Romney and Obama stayed away from numbers of really important issues, such as Obamacare. Romney was the architect of Obamacare. He didn't want to talk about it. President Obama didn't want to either. They didn't discuss it. They did show their machismo and who was going to bomb Iran first and who was going to do it more quickly. Uh, we would have said, no, we're not going to bomb Iran under any circumstances unless they attack us or our allies. Immigration issues, drug policy issues, they would have been discussed. Who would have lost? Well, probably the Democratic and Republican candidates who didn't want to do this and didn't. Who would have won? You would have. So I'm here to tell you there is a lawsuit right now pending in Washington, D.C., probably brought by Governor Gary Johnson and me, Judge Jim Gray, as well as the, we're inviting the Libertarian Party to participate and the Green Party to make your votes count more. So these are things I think you should just be aware of. The Presidential Debates Commission should be responsive to the will of the people and to be able to discuss issues with viable candidates. That's what I think from the judges' chambers. What do you think? Because your vote is important. Your thoughts are important as well. We'll talk about more of these issues soon.